Guess what, everybody? I like Tears of the Kingdom. It's a pretty good game. Some might even say it's the action adventure game of the year. Whatever that means. This game consumed my life for the good chunk of the year. According to my Nintendo Wrapped, I played 66 hours in May and 97 hours in June. After beating it, I took a well-deserved break, but I knew the game had more to offer. Fast forward a few months, and I decided to do a glitchy playthrough of the game on Twitch. I messed around with a bunch of things, like item duplication, learned the any percent route through the Great Sky Island, and I was just having a great time. Things did take a bit of a turn, though. You see, I actually jumped directly into the depths without touching Hyrule Kingdom first. Because of this, I found out I couldn't warp back to the sky or the surface. It seems the map isn't programmed to scroll from the depths to the sky. It's only meant to jump from the depths to the surface, so if you don't have the surface, you're stuck. Why isn't it letting me go to the sky map? Up on the D-pad isn't working. Uh, <laughs> how the fuck do we get out of here? <laughs> nah, I wasn't stuck. Eventually, I found a place to ascend and continued on my merry way. But the harrowing experience did get me thinking. What if I had been stuck? I didn't have a paraglider, I barely had any equipment, no heart or stamina upgrades. What if I had to spend the rest of my playthrough down here? What can I even do? An innocent question, right? Cue the next three months of my life. I guess the first step is to define 100% completion. I'm going to try to activate all 120 light routes, completing the map and earning the Dispelling Darkness Medal. In addition to this, I want to get every piece of legendary gear scattered throughout the depths. I'm also going to do the Master Koga side quest because it feels important. You may have a different definition of 100% in the depths, in which case I'd love to watch your video. This challenge is actually super fun, but this is the one I'm rolling with. Now let's talk about what I'm not allowed to do. Remember those fun glitches I mentioned earlier? Some of them are pretty strong. You might even say they're too strong. Let me walk you through them now. The spirit of this challenge is survival. Every resource is limited since blood moons can only happen in the surface world. That means every enemy I kill stays dead, and every item I collect is non-renewable. For obvious reasons, I'm banning any kind of item duplication, whether it's infinite bomb flowers or duping 10 versions of the strongest weapon I can find. Every single resource needs to be legitimately acquired, and once I use the resource, it must be removed from my inventory as intended. In the spirit of this, I'm also banning any technique that artificially increases my damage output. This means I can't just zuggle 15 spears and kill a Lionel in one hit. I'm gonna go ahead and ban Amiibos too, since they're renewable in nature and they provide resources that aren't obtainable in the depths. With all that in mind, let's discuss setup. I started a new file and completed the Great Sky Island. After this, I warped right to the Fuse Shrine and used a wing to reach this island over here. I dumped everything out of my inventory and grabbed a single fairy for the drop. With nothing but a fairy in my pocket, I jumped off the island and fell into the Great Plateau Chasm. The fairy will break my fall and leave my inventory, placing me in the depths with absolutely nothing. Without further ado, let's get into it. The moment I hit the ground with my fairy, the only source of light I had was the faint glow of postals. Now I'm completely naked in the depths with no gear, no healing items, and no direction. I had to stumble around for a minute or two until I found a Zonai device outpost. This one has everything I need to get started. I took two fans and a steering stick and combined them to make a rudimentary flying device. It flies a little crooked, but beats walking. Before I could even give it a proper test flight, I found my first light route. Look at that, only 119 to go. This is gonna be easy. The light routes illuminate parts of the map, so the more I find, the easier it'll be to get around and find more. With my newfound sense of sight, I found a friendly shadow man who offered me a weapon. Things are looking up for me. The only other thing I can even see is a distant structure, so I guess I'm heading that way. 
Since I have the default battery and no way to charge it, I'm spending half my time carrying the hover bike around, which hardly beats walking. Inside the structure, I received the auto build rune. This lets me summon anything I've built with Ultra Hand anytime I want. And yes, it's going to be important later. Now that I have auto build, I went ahead and rebuilt my hover bike on flat ground. Yeah, this'll do. And it beats walking. With my trusty Claymore, I decided to brave the monster camp just outside the structure. You can tell I'm a city slicker because maneuvers like this are not ideal down here. At this point, I was just getting used to not having a paraglider. And spoiler alert, it's gonna take me a while to come to terms with that. This monster camp was definitely a rude awakening for me. I had played over 150 hours of Tears of the Kingdom at this point, but I hadn't tried to survive in the depths with nothing. My bold behavior was rewarded with a swift death. Uh, unfortunately for them, I had nothing going on that afternoon, so I threw my face against the camp until they were all dead. After clearing the monster camp and grabbing some mediocre gear, I decided to double back to the auto build temple and complete the first Master Koga fight. This one was easy, but I'm sure that trend won't continue. These abandoned mines are my only source of Zonite charges. I can't upgrade my batteries, so these charges are incredibly valuable for long distance flying. I can't use them too often though, as they're pretty expensive and I'm not allowed to duplicate more. I ventured through the dark for a little while longer and found my first piece of legendary clothing, the Miner's Trousers. These bad boys are actually a source of light, which is quite the hot commodity down here. You know, combat down here isn't really too bad so long as you're- God damn it! I cleared another group of ruffians and nabbed myself a shield. Shields are an incredibly important resource down here for a few reasons, none of which I can do at the moment, but believe me, it's gonna be huge. I can't really overstate how difficult it is to make a living down here. Without a regular supply of healing items, I'm basically always at critical health. Here I died because a guy tossed a pebble at me. Right now my only real method of healing is to die, which seems counterintuitive, but I'll keep it in my back pocket. We're about an hour into this challenge, and I'm already starting to question what I've gotten myself into. The most basic things down here can be absolutely miserable without the privileges of the surface world. It didn't get easier overnight either. This right here is 90 minutes of work. Jealous? I'm mostly just grabbing as many resources as I can while hitting the early game light routes. Luckily for me, there's Zonite deposits every 20 feet or so. It's a living, but I hate my life. I can't just blame the depths for my misery though. Half of these deaths were caused by plain old terrible decision making. In the overworld, you get to make these silly mistakes without much issue, but down here it's so punishing. Ah, sweet, a skeleton horse. Don't get too attached. You will never see her again. These Yiga outposts are great resources for materials. They're the only reliable place to find food in the entire depths, and it's a limited resource. The Yiga themselves drop mighty bananas, but you can also find bananas in crates or just kind of lying around. None of this is much help without a cooking pot though, which is why this Yiga outpost is especially important. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to the blessing, the savior, the love of my life! Meet the only cooking pot in the entire depths. That's right, there's only one, and it's in the middle of fucking nowhere. I'm going to need to warp to the nearest light route and spend three minutes walking every single time I need to cook something. Are you starting to see why I lost my mind down here? It. I'm tired of being a slave to gravity. I need to learn how to fall damage cancel. I picked a cliff and got to work watching shitty YouTube tutorials on the subject. Basically, you just need to initiate a jump slash and open the rune menu at the same time. Then you open the shield menu directly after closing the rune menu, swap shields, and then start a new jump slash the moment you close the menu. Cancel that jump slash with another dive, and you'll cancel all of your momentum, surviving any fall. Sounds easy? It wasn't. That took 20 minutes to land the first time. Being able to do this technique opens up a huge number of options for my movement though. While I can technically survive most falls on a hover bike, there are going to be important moments later where that's just not an option. So it's probably smart to just practice this now. Found the final piece of the miner's outfit and ugh. Can we please keep Kink out of pride? Even with a full set of light armor, I still couldn't see this stalactite coming. Are you actually kidding me? 
There are six coliseums located in the depths, and each of them contains a piece of legendary gear. The first one I stumbled upon happened to be the Desert Coliseum, located in the southwest corner of the map. These arenas have multiple waves of enemies, and once you defeat them all, you get to open the chest. Seems simple enough, and it was! Now we have the Sheik Mask. Oh, oh no! 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 What is this? No! No! Please! What the fuck? There's these three large skeletons in the depths that contain the tunic, cap, and booty shorts of the wild. I grabbed the tunic under the Gerudo Desert and left without any problem. Oh dear god, he's back! Skeleton horse! Where are you? Go the police! Oh my god! I found a Zonai device outpost with rockets and decided to try another technique I found on YouTube. This one's called Pocket Rocket, and it's pretty great. To do it, fuse a rocket to your shield at the same moment you swap shields. This will cause a bug called Fuse Entanglement, which I'm not about to explain because I didn't go to grad school. Once you've done Fuse Entanglement, fuse the same rocket to your sword. If you do this correctly, you can shield jump and rhythmically swap between jump attacks and shield surfing to soar through the air. Unfortunately, my shield was just a boy and could not handle the greatness of this trick. He died in my arms, and I'll never be the same. Just gonna revert to my last save to get that shield back, since I need it for fall damage cancels. I'm gonna need another shield to be my pocket rocket bitch. For now, it's just a dream. But someday I'll fly. Dreaming's for liberals! I'm getting myself a second shield right now! My koblins have a rare chance to wield them, but you're much more likely to get one in a like-like's chest. I massacred this camp, and my reward was everything I've ever wanted. I will learn from this. I'm mostly showing successful fall damage cancels, but I do want you to know that half my attempts looked like this for the first few hours. Beautiful stuff. Who needs paragliding when you have this strategy at home? Just repeatedly jump slash cancel through the air and nail a fall damage cancel at the end, and you can sort of get around in the same way? If you're scared, you can always just climb down. It's terrible and slow, but it technically works. Since I have a super durable second shield now, I decided to try Pocket Rocket again. If you nail the fall damage cancel, it's actually a great way to get around. What I'm saying is it's a horrible way to get around. Nabbed myself to spanks of time, so that's another Link Armor we're working on. This game's secretly a fashion simulator. Here's a fun trick. Tired of your hover bike bouncing around every time you land? Let go of the steering stick and use recall on it right before you hit the ground. Instantly end recall and the bike will lightly fall the remainder of the way to the ground. You know, just a helpful tip in case you ever decide to subject yourself to this. Just be sure you have recall equipped and not ultra hand- OH MY GOD! Uh, oh! I'm okay! After climbing out of the water, I found my first legendary weapon, the Hero Sword from Zelda 1. It's not like special or anything. I mean, it'll shatter like anything else, but it is unique. So I'm going to collect every piece of legendary weaponry I can find down here. What would life be like with a paraglider? Maybe some stamina upgrades or sunlight? I don't know. And because of that, I'm content. <laughs> you smell that? It smells like a problem. One of the legendary outfits is in that lava biome, but I burst into flames within seconds of entering. Luckily, I was able to get in and out within five seconds, but things only get worse from here. The next light route is on the other side of even more lava pillars. I was able to fly through the hot zone while only sustaining life ruining injuries, not life ending. But this is starting to concern me. Who has time for anxiety when there's fashion to be had? Another thing that's worrying me are these underground mazes. These are supposed to be entered from the surface, but that's like, obviously ultra banned. There are three pieces of legendary armor hidden inside these things, so I've got to figure out a way inside sooner or later. This right here is a bargaining statue. You can sell souls to them in exchange for exclusive legendary clothing and any other legendary gear you found down in the depths. This is where you get the Dark Link and Depths outfit. I already actually found one of these earlier, but it was on my skeleton horse and I promised you I'd never show you her again. So just know that I'm riding her frequently and you do not get to see it. I decided to take a trip to the single cooking pot in the depths and made myself some healing items. I don't have much, but over the past nine or so hours, I've gathered a few things. These mighty bananas can heal me and grant attack up. But Koblen Fire Archers carry these fire fruits, which heal a quarter heart, and that's technically healing. I've also found these Glowfists, which grant a pretty useless glow effect, but they can heal you if cooked. 
What really sucks is these items are basically useless unless I also find and cook Sundaliant, which recover the hearts I lose from the Depth's Gloom effect. Here it is, everyone. Nine hours worth of grinding to get this view. Bone apple tea. I was minding my own business, pillaging a Bacoblin camp when the fuzz walked by. Lucky for me, I had a knight's claymore with desperate strength, giving it double damage on my last heart. I also fused a silver horoblin horn to it for a weapon that deals 86 damage when I'm at critical health. I intentionally damaged down with gloom in order to make my maximum health one heart. Then I ate an attack up meal I made with Yiga bananas. It took five actual minutes of intense warfare against a white lion with a single heart, but I got a no problem because I play video games instead of having sex. Oh, hey, look, I finished the tunic of time. Now I'm cute as a button. I think this is where I was really getting comfortable with the fall damage cancel. This would have taken me like 15 tries a few hours ago, but now I'm getting it on my first one. And look, the Wind Waker Boomerang. You know, I never actually really use boomerangs this much in Breath of the Wild or Tears of the Kingdom. They're pretty... Uh, oh. It's okay. Uh, I could just... Yeah, this is how boomerangs work. They come back to you. All right, I'm about half finished with the map now. It's been 11 hours, but watching the map take shape is extremely rewarding. So, funny story. I was flying a little close to the ceiling and actually triggered the Hyrule Kingdom jingle. I checked my map and sure enough, I had the surface on it. I had no idea this was even possible, but I technically just failed the challenge. No worries though, I just reverted to my last save and repressed the memory. It's not like I was doing anything, I guess. No idea how it took me 11 hours to think of this, but I just tried tossing a bright bloom seed against the front of my steering stick and oh my God, I can see. Oh great, another firelight rude. How am I supposed to get to this one? Uh, oh, I guess it's not hot over here. Maybe I just don't know enough about lava. Just passing through the spear temple for a light rude. Spoiler alert, I'm not gonna beat it. The quest starts on the surface, and I've never been there in my entire life. This place isn't totally useless to us, though. It actually has one of the only two device dispensers in the entire depths. Here, we're able to get rockets, wings, and steering sticks on demand. And yeah, they're going to be a big deal. Now that we have these tools, techniques like Pocket Rocket won't be restricted to areas where you just happen to find rockets flying around. Though we still do need shields to burn for them. This is also the only place in the depths I found these construct enemies, which is really useful since they drop items you could drop into the dispensers. I bought the Dark Link pants from another bargaining statue and oh yeah, I'm looking good. I feel ready to take on the next big hurdle of this challenge. Now that I have steering sticks, I can wriggle my way into these underground mazes. If you stick two devices together with Ultra Hand, it becomes a blueprint you can summon anytime with auto build. This is how I get my hover bike whenever I need it. But there's also a powerful exploit called auto build cancel that I haven't gotten to use until now. I stuck the sticks together and saved the build. After disposing of the real sticks, I summoned the blueprint. Until you press A to create the build, the object hovers in front of Link in a transparent state. So far, all of this is intended behavior. If I open the auto build menu while the sticks are hovering in front of me, I can exploit the menu by closing it at the same time I attempt to summon the build again. This cancels the entire process and gives me full control of Link's movement. If done correctly, the object will stay loaded and hover a set distance in front of Link. Since this is a steering stick, I can actually grab onto it with the A button. The stick is supposed to stay a certain distance away from Link at all times, and if you approach it under normal circumstances, it'll move away from you. If Link's holding onto the stick, however, it can never reach the set distance required and will always try to float away from him. If you do this up against a wall, you can actually just go right through it. That might have been a lot to unpack, but I can put it very simply for you. This beats the absolute shit out of walking. Just try to walk through that wall. This trick is called ghost stick clipping. And while I was able to find a few tutorials for it online, I couldn't really find many setups for the clips I personally need to do in this challenge. I'm sure I could get help from a discord or something, but I actually had a lot of fun finding my own ways into these forbidden places. After about 15 minutes of trial and error, I finally clipped into the first maze. Learning the finer details of this stick was definitely what took me so long. 
There's just an art to it that I can't really describe, but now I am beyond matter, and nothing can contain me. Especially not this dinky robot. The second maze required two clips, but that's all the more time to practice. If I extrapolate, I'm going to guess the third maze will require three clips. Oh. Oh, no. I can't... I can't get over there. Guess the cat's out of the bag. You've probably been thinking since the start of this video, but there are certain parts of the depths that aren't contiguous with the rest of the underworld. Much like with the three mazes, you can't access these areas from the depths itself. You actually need to descend through a chasm in the overworld, which is a crime. So if I want to get to these light routes and complete the challenge, I'm going to need to find a way into these non-contiguous areas. What's my plan? Well, I'll think of something. This is just 15 minutes of Link standing completely still. My notes say bathroom break. Like, with quotations in a winky face. Why did I write this? Was I worried I'd be, like, confused? Well, now I am. Check out this flawless 10. Not sure if I was panicking or showing off, but either way, I'm impressed. This is also where I discovered the magic of the puff shroom. I was getting swarmed and just wanted some crowd control, so I threw one down. It basically just ends the fight immediately for every monster in its range. Look, they aren't even fighting back. The shit is ridiculous. I still don't have a good answer for these fire areas. I'm just gonna head southeast and get every light route at a reasonable temperature first. After some spelunking, I managed to find the Sea Breeze Shield, and this is huge! Shields are a limited resource in the depths since there aren't blood moons, but this is a legendary item. That means I can buy replacements from the bargaining statues. It's a terrible conversion rate, but it's a whole lot better than nothing. Now I finally have access to a renewable shield with decent durability, opening up the possibility to do Pocket Rocket much more often. Finish the Skyward Sword outfit. God, I love that game. I think the Forest Coliseum is probably my favorite. The fact that you follow a trail of 26 bananas to the arena just to have the Yiga sick of Hinox on you is like insanely funny. Also, you're rewarded with this adorable Korok mask. Okay, so this is the first time things get a little weird. You see, defeating Phantom Ganon inside the Great Deku Tree is technically a depths quest, but I don't actually have any way into the room. It's in the depths, but my basic bitch clipping skills just aren't quite there yet. I can clip into the out of bounds area surrounding the arena, and for some reason my arrows go right through the floor, so I was actually able to defeat Phantom Ganon without even entering his arena. What's really funny is the subsequent cutscene teleports you to a certain spot in the arena, so I can actually grab the Gloom Sword Phantom Ganon dropped. Take a nice long look, kids. We're not going up there. We're going back to hell. Oh, sweet! This outer area doesn't even have a light route. That means I don't have to... God damn it, there's a legendary outfit out there. I suppose I can't avoid it forever. I very carefully clipped out of bounds and rode the ghost stick all the way to the outer area. After grabbing onto the back side of the wall, I tried and failed to clip inside. The collision here is like really weird, and I'm not very good with ghost stick yet. Eventually, I slipped down into the inside of a stalactite. This is relatively flat ground, and there's actually nothing stopping the stick from appearing right in front of me now. And oh, I finally managed to clip back in bounds and landed the most stressful fall damage cancel of my life. Oh, hey, look, a ruby. That's a surprise tool that'll help us later. Oh god, oh shit, please, no, 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 please, no, 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 please, god, sweet Jesus, please, please, just let me grab it, grab it, grab it, grab it, yes! Now I've got the full Wind Waker set. Look at him, he's just a boy. Got a little on fire for this light route, but that's fine, because it was just a little. Not sure how I'm gonna push further, but that's future me's problem. I still have, like, ten more light routes that aren't on fire, like this one. Undershot it a little, but that's fine. Wait... What? What's going on? Who the fuck's chasm is this? Thank God I discovered the magic of puff shrooms. I managed to sneak strike literally every single one of these bozos without any issue. Oh, hey, look, there's pants down here. Perfect timing, because I'm pretty sure I just shit mine. That's right, you sniveling little piss babies. We're at Light Route 100! Only 20 to go! With every corner of the map done but one, 
I don't think I can avoid it any longer, though. I finally got to address the elephant in the room. This little bit down here. Oh, it's gonna be a tricky one too. Just look at that distance I have to travel out of bounds. I better grab some rockets from the construct factory just in case and another shield from the bargaining statue. I went to the closest possible point on the map and attempted the clip. Getting out of bounds wasn't the issue, but something terrible started to happen. My clipping device has an upward curve and ah, uh, sunlight. As soon as the overworld started loading, I abandoned ship. This won't do. I need to come up with some other way. After clipping out of bounds the second time, I did a sick backwards jump slash combo and landed out of bounds, but on solid ground. Now I can make a hover bike and fly across. Man, video games are just fake when you think about it. I made it to the wall and did a blind descent until I eventually ended up in another stalactite by absolute chance. Once again, I was able to make my ghost stick and clip through the wall, performing a fall damage cancel that was somehow even more stressful than last time. I'm in. I headed to the Lone Island Combat Arena and, uh, listen, I I'm not normally like this, but maybe we should patch puff shrooms? Not like it would affect me or anything. I'm playing on 1.0. The only thing protecting me from poor balance is self-control, which I have very little of. Found another bargaining statue and finished the Dark Link outfit. Mom might not understand, but she doesn't have to. Unfortunately, this is actually the last bargaining statue I can interact with down here. The Plateau Mine statue requires grabbing its four eyeballs from the surface. I toyed with the idea of maybe clipping out of bounds, flying up to the plateau, and somehow grabbing the eyes with Ultra Hand without touching the surface, but going that high would load Hyrule Kingdom, which would automatically fail the challenge anyway. This puts the final piece of the Depths armor as the only thing so far that's technically in the depths, but totally unobtainable within the rules of the challenge. What a shame, too. My solution sounded so fun and easy. Now I've arrived at the northeast corner of the map, and the last maze is just out of bounds. I run into the same problem with my ghost stick endlessly ascending, but I don't see anywhere to make a hover bike this time. No worries, though. I stored a pocket rocket and ditched the ghost stick about halfway. Then I pocket rocketed the rest of the distance. I found my way into another stalactite and clipped inside. I had a hell of a time finding my way into the maze this time. It's a concrete box. I actually had to clip two more times just to get into the combat area. So I guess this maze did require three clips. After making that boss my girlfriend, I finished the Phantom Ganon outfit. It's kind of fitting that I needed the ability to float through walls to get this one. There we go. We also just finished off the Hero's Clothes set. We're so close. I didn't plan on smiting this Lionel, but he looked at me funny, so you know I had to do it to him. Another arena, another reason to ban Puff Shrooms. Double kill. I'm going to try to reach this non-contiguous area under Lake Hylia, which means I'll need another pocket rocket and a ghost clip. Uh, the game didn't seem to like that. Let's try again. I used Pocket Rocket to clear the distance and spent five solid minutes finding my way in. This time, at least, I won't need a stressful fall damage cancel. I can just gently Pocket Rocket my way down and... Oh. I disagree with what just happened, but it turns out I don't actually get a vote. Like with War. I was 3% more careful this time and made it through without issue. Time to tackle the next non-contiguous area! It feels a little less impressive every time I do it, but I know I'm still special. I also clipped into this weird light route right in the middle of the map. There's all this glowing stuff, I don't know. Definitely didn't have the closest call of my life, oh my god! All right, guys. There's obviously one part of the map left, and I've been avoiding it long enough. That's right, baby nips! It's the light route at the end of the Master Koga Quest!
Man, I really hoped that would take more time. There's gotta be something else to do, right? Done all the arenas, found basically every piece of legendary gear. I could call my mom, I guess. It's been three long weeks now. Uh, fine! You probably didn't notice because I've been so good at hiding it, but I've been avoiding the northeast part of the map for a reason. It's an area entirely comprised of fire and lava, and you burn within five seconds of entering. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I seriously don't know what to do. I kept thinking I'd know what to do. I just kept working on the video, hoping eventually, I don't know, maybe I'd figure it out, but I didn't, and I haven't, and I don't know what to do. I don't know what to fucking do! Okay, let's just take a deep breath and look over our options. We can just lay the problem out and speak about them in neutral terms. There are 10 light roots remaining, and I need to activate them all to complete the challenge. What's preventing me from doing this? Fire! I'm on fucking fire! Jesus shit! <sighs> it's a little hot. Link ignites after standing in the heat for five seconds. After that, he loses a heart every second until he dies. That means under the best conditions, I have about nine seconds in extreme heat before dying. So what can I do to beat the heat? The best solution is obviously to wear fireproof armor or drink a fireproof elixir. This totally negates the heat and lets you walk around like normal. Unfortunately, this isn't an option. The fireproof armor can only be purchased in Goron Village, and while I do have a cooking pot, I don't have any fireproof lizards or smothering butterflies to make an elixir. The only critters down here grant the useless glow effect. So circumventing the heat full stop isn't an option. What else do we have to work with? Well, there's not technically a timer counting down to my death, it's only my health bar. If I could keep my hearts from reaching zero, I could theoretically burn for hours. Is there an invincibility glitch in this game? Yes, actually, but it requires 16 shock emitters, and those are inaccessible in the depths. Okay, but this still feels like a promising lead. If I can't make myself invincible, what if I just kept eating? You know, like in that terminal montage animation? That would technically work, but there just isn't enough food down here. Without Blood Moons to respawn the Yiga Boys and Flame Archer Bacoblins, food is a limited resource. Even if I spent 10 hours gathering every single piece of food in the depths, there's no guarantee that would even work. Each banana would only essentially buy me an extra second of life. That's just not a good enough conversion rate to be a viable strategy. Okay. If I can't do anything about my health, what about the heat itself? Maybe there's a way to unload the area's temperature value. Nope. Okay, what if I'm willing to bend the rules a little? Maybe there's an amiibo that can give me fireproof lizards or something. I found a table of every amiibo drop in the game, and it's definitely possible to get items to endure intense cold, moderate heat, electricity, ice, and even fucking glowing in the dark. But of the 29 unique amiibo loot tables, none of them drop fireproof lizards. <sighs> That's fine. I was even willing to compromise the rules of the challenge, but it's fine. I'll figure something else out. There's three elemental dragons that fly through the depths on a cycle. Is that anything? Maybe Dinril's parts can be made into fireproof elixirs? No, they cannot. Okay. Well, maybe I can... Or maybe I... It's possible that I could just... Come on, think. It can't end like this. Hot, oh, it's so hot. It's so hot down here. Oh, God, I'm so hot. It's killing me. So hot, so dark, no light, no way to beat the heat. I can't make any progress. Every time I die, I'm just sent back to the last place I saved. How am I supposed to... How am I supposed to... Wait. The last place I saved... You gotta be fucking kidding me. So, 
it turns out there's a pretty simple solution after all. In past Zelda games, dying would send you back to the start of an area. This would have worked too well in games like Tears of the Kingdom, which doesn't even have a loading zone aside from the shrines. Whenever you die in this game, you're sent back to the last piece of stable ground you saved on and given three hearts. This also resets the five second countdown to Link igniting. By abusing these intended mechanics to the utmost degree, you can actually survive indefinitely in extreme heat. Well, survive isn't the best word. You can die indefinitely in extreme heat. But every time you die, you keep your progress. This means we can spawn with three hearts, run for five seconds, save, burn to death, and respawn exactly where we died while locking in the five seconds of movement. I cannot believe this is possible. I genuinely spent weeks researching workarounds for the heat in this game and couldn't find anything. As far as I'm aware, nobody has documented this exploit in any public forum. I'm not saying I'm the first person in the world to ever think of this, but I did think of it all on my own. Well, all right then, that's one light route down, only nine to go. And all I gotta do is walk to the rest of them while dying every five seconds, spend 30 seconds respawning, and then dying again five seconds later. Hey, wait a minute, this is gonna suck. And it did. You're only seeing the deaths, but every single one of these had a 30 second loading screen between them. With that said, you might be curious how long this area took, and I'll happily tell you it was three hours, 15 minutes, and 59 seconds. You might not believe that I subjected myself to something this tedious for three hours, but I've actually uploaded the entire area as an unlisted video so you can verify it for yourself. The link's in the description. Sorry if it's a little crispy. I seem to enjoy frying links. Just in case you think this is an easy fix, I should mention there are quite a few limitations that made this pretty difficult. First of all, your location data is only saved if you're firmly planted on safe, solid ground. If Link is in any kind of action state like jumping, climbing, flying, or anything like that, you'll respawn at his last safely grounded coordinates. This means any light route that requires climbing will need a creative workaround. For example, this light route required me to climb over a couple boulders. I barely managed to get over them in 8 seconds, and it took me like 10 tries. I guess at the end of the day, nothing really beats walking. It's my only option now. You see that right there? That distance took me 20 minutes. I wish I had more to show you, but the actual execution of this is far less interesting than the fact that it's possible at all. I did discover a few silly quirks of the game though. Like if you jump at the same time Link burns to death, his gravity gets all funky. Got a wicked shield surf right here. Crossed the distance of like three saves at once. It really made me feel alive. And then I died. That right there is Light Route 115. Only five more, then we're done with this nightmare. No idea how I'm gonna get to that one. Walking's all I have left, and I don't think I can walk up there in eight seconds. Well, there's four more before I even have to worry about that, so let's move on. Here's another one that definitely requires you to beat walking. I'll need to pull out an old trick to get this one. I saved in an optimal position and then died to restore my hearts. The moment I respawned, I built a hover bike and flew across. This was definitely a mistake, but for some reason I doubled down and ate most of my food to damage tank the rest of the way there. I have no idea why I did that, but now I'm almost out of food again. Walked my way to the next one with no issue and grabbed the last piece of the wild link set. We're almost there. Had to build myself a contraption to cross this distance in 8 seconds. Look at that. Can't believe that worked. I temporarily left the heat and slayed this skeleton Hinox to grab the last legendary weapon, the Biggeron Sword. After another 20 minutes in the oven, or until Link was cooked to a delicious golden brown, I arrived at the 119th light route. This is the last one at walking level, which means it's time to figure out how to get that one up there. I tried using the contraption from earlier, but that doesn't get me anywhere near the height I need. If you save on the contraption, you're just sent back to solid ground, so that's not an option. That means I'll need to find a way to get to one of the highest points in the depths in less than 8 seconds. I scouted the area, but it's well into the heat bubble. There's no cool point to start from. In fact, the closest point of safety seems to be the light route I just obtained. I can warp to it any time and start from there. With no other options, I returned to the cooking pod and cooked the last of my food and do a few meals. I'm going to need to damage tank my way to the last light route. Since I ate so much earlier, I only have five dishes to my name. It's gotta be enough. I warped to the light route with a pocket rocket stored and took off immediately. I used a large zone I charged and then ate my first meal. After flapping a few more times, I ate the second. 
I have to be extremely careful not to die of fall damage here. So I ate my third meal and then went for a fall damage cancel. You still burn at a normal rate in bullet time, which means I was so injured I needed to eat meal number four right after landing. And... Yes! 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 I did it! I fucking did it! All 120 light roots! All of them! Even all of the ones in the fire area! I did it! God, yes! I honestly didn't know how I was gonna do this when I started the challenge. I, I just hoped and kept playing, and eventually I figured it out, and I, I did it! Oh, God, I can't believe things went that smoothly. Oh, now all I have to do is edit the video, and then I can have this bad boy up by Christmas! Wait, there's a Scorching Coliseum? This is what we in the business call a certified fucking disaster. I'm facing a combat arena with multiple waves of enemies, and I can only stay alive for eight seconds. I don't even know what I'm supposed to do here, but I did play around with a few ideas. Maybe if I went and farmed every Yiga outpost in the depths, I could have enough bananas to tank the fire damage? Maybe I could find a way to despawn the enemies with overloading glitches. That might work, right? To show you how truly desperate I was while theorycrafting for this segment, I even went and purchased a guardian amiibo just in case I needed the ancient blades it drops. These can kill enemies in one hit, so maybe that would help. But even with that, I still don't think I can kill four waves of enemies in eight seconds. But I already had my freak out. I've gotten too far to roll over and compromise the rules of this challenge with amiibo or item duplication. Maybe I'm just going about this all wrong. Maybe all I need to do is what I've been doing. Eight seconds isn't much, but I can still save my position data in the arena. If I put myself in just the right spot, I should be able to kill the first wave of enemies and see what I'm dealing with. Yeah, this isn't possible. With my measly eight seconds, I barely managed to defeat the first wave of moblins. At least I saved my position. Maybe I can do more if I start closer? Holy shit, they're still dead. So it turns out the game gives you a checkpoint on each wave, which is probably the single most forgiving thing that's happened to me in this video. I'm not joking when I say without this strange mechanic, this arena might actually be impossible unless I severely broke a few rules of the challenge. Using this unexpected grace, I managed to clear the next two waves without issue. The last wave is gonna be a big problem though. Wave three was a single white moblin that took me the whole eight seconds to kill. So I'm not sure how I'm supposed to defeat another one and three other moblins at the same time. It's just not possible. Not without an ace in the hole. I would basically need to delete the three black moblins the moment the wave began and focus all of my attention on the white one. But the only thing that could do that would be a... Ruby. I got a single random ruby drop about 10 hours ago in the challenge. It can easily obliterate the weaker moblins and take a hefty chunk of the white moblins' health to boot. With extremely precise execution, half a dozen failed attempts, and eating the last piece of food in my inventory to tank two seconds of fire damage, I managed to clear the final wave and open the chest containing the last piece of legendary armor in the challenge, Zant's Helmet. Well, okay, it's not the last piece of armor I got. I totally forgot to kill the King Gliok and finish Twilight Princess Link's outfit. But now I've done that, and you won't ruin this for me. I've gotten every piece of armor. Except for finishing the depth suit, but I already explained why I can't do that. And I refuse to let you ruin this for me. And I guess I did technically use this amiibo, even if I didn't end up needing it. But I'm throwing the Ancient Blades away, and you are not about to ruin this for me. I did it. I'm done. It's over. Certified Tears of the Kingdom experts might know that there's one point of interest in the depths that I haven't mentioned thus far. The game ends down here. I had this in the back of my mind the whole time, but I honestly didn't think I'd make it this far. Would it really be satisfying to wrap things up with a ruby blast and a couple of sneak strikes? Maybe. But I'm a gamer, and there's one more challenge down here that's calling my name. Before I tackle the finale, I spent two hours scouring the depths for any power-ups I had left. I hunted the Lionel population to extinction and stole their bows. I also hit every Yiga outpost I could find to replenish my banana reserves. That's not all, though. I found a knight's broadsword with attack up and desperate strength. 
After fusing a Lionel Horn to it, this is a one-handed weapon that does 152 damage. Yeah, that'll do. Uh, no, Park Ranger, I don't know what happened to the Lino that lives around here. Maybe he migrated for the winter. I also hit up a few bargaining statues for Seabree Shields. Can't take those postals with me to the next challenge. Gotta spend them now. Thankfully, Hyrule has a Second Amendment, otherwise the Royal Guard would raid me for this stack of bows. Okay, after two hours of stockpiling, this is what I'm taking to the end. Got right to Ganon's front porch before I realized I didn't cook anything. That's embarrassing. <laughs> Getting to the big guy wasn't really a problem. He has a Lionel in his yard, but if you think I'm gonna have trouble with a Lionel, you can just unsubscribe right now. This ice area was almost intimidating until I remembered Zant's helmet makes you invulnerable to ice, so... It's essential that I kill these chew jellies. I don't have another source of water damage without them. Zelda's hand has touched this torch. Here we are, kids. This is where it's all going down. Before I get to Ganon, I need to take out his army. This includes four waves of enemies and six boss battles. Unlike the Scorching Colosseum, there are no checkpoints this time around. That means I have to take on an army of Bacoblins, Lizalfos, Gibdo, and Moblins, followed immediately by Kolgera, Marbled Goma, Mukturok, Queen Gibdo, Seized Construct, and Phantom Ganon in a row without dying a single time. Getting hit by any of these enemies typically results in an instant death, and I have to save my food for specific parts of the gauntlet. This might be the part of the challenge I underestimated the most. I might have catastrophized the Scorching Coliseum a bit, but I definitely didn't fear this gauntlet enough. At first, I went in without any plan. There's a ton of enemies, but I'm pretty good at this point. Turns out being pretty good isn't enough when it comes to something like this. A single mistake can send you back to the start, and mistakes pile up when you're winging it. After banging my head against the wall for an hour, I decided to regroup. Whenever I'm lost in this challenge, I tend to watch speedrunners for inspiration. Most categories skip this section with a simple clip, and while I certainly considered that option, I think it just spits in the face of the challenge. I didn't choose to do this because it was easy, I did it because it was hard. Almost every glitch I utilized opened the door to new and interesting avenues for the challenge. It opened the game up. Clipping right into Ganondorf feels like the opposite. I'd be trivializing a good challenge, and for what? Whether I like it or not, this is possible. Insanely difficult? Yeah, but that's not a good enough reason to cheap out on the ending. I'm not completely out of luck, though. The any percent glitchless speedrun has to do this gauntlet. That run uses a few things from the surface, but I should be able to grab some strategies from it. With all that in mind, here's the Simply Snaps method for beating Ganon's army. This recipe only uses resources from the depths, so be sure to go caving for a few hours before following along at home. I start with a fall damage cancel to survive this fall. If you can't do that by now, it's time to reevaluate your choices. Wave number one has Bacoblins. The moment I gain control of Link, I shield jump with a fused bomb to launch myself into the air. With this leverage, I can get three bullet time shots before running out of stamina. I use bomb flowers with each shot to maximize the carnage. You can substitute this with basil if you live in an area that prohibits explosives. After that tactical strike, I clean the remaining Bacoblins the old-fashioned way. The leader has a hilarious amount of health, so I actually find it easier to just freeze the big guy and push him off the ledge. After wave one, I quickly fuse another bomb flower to my shield. Second verse is same as the first, but a whole lot louder and a whole lot worse. At the end of this phase, I fuse a spear to my broadsword. It's got mediocre damage, but the range will be needed later. Wave three begins with another war crime, but I'm careful to pick up as many Gibdo wings as possible. Wave four is filled to the brim with moblins, and you already know what we do to those. Whew. That's the first four waves down. Now I just need to beat the game's six bosses and we're golden. This was a really interesting challenge for me because I've only ever fought these bosses at the end of their respective dungeons with the sage by my side. They can all be damaged by several means, so it's totally possible to fight them solo, but it was all new for me. We start this nightmare with the worst boss by far, Kolgera. This is actually my favorite boss casually, but it's a new beast entirely when you have to fight it without a fucking paraglider. You're meant to defeat this boss by diving through its weak points or shooting them with arrows. Getting anywhere near the weak points requires the paraglider, though. 
The entire arena is filled with an updraft at the start of the fight, but that doesn't do fucking anything for me in this state. Without a paraglider, I have to shoot Kogero's weak points from the ground. This is really tricky, but I got a few ideas from the glitchless any percent run. The moment the fight starts, I sprint to the edge of the arena. Kogera is supposed to fly in this direction, but sometimes just doesn't. If this happens, I panic and probably die. If Kogera cooperates, I wait for it to fly directly above me and use a rocket shield to yeet my way up. Now I'm officially high enough to die from fall damage, so no pressure or anything. Remember those Gibdo wings I picked up? Well, this is the time to use them. They extend the range of your shots by a huge margin, but it's not infinite. Your shots can still fall short, and if they do, that's one shot wasted. You can try to land a fall damage cancel and rock it back up if you have enough supplies, but missing a single shot basically means you have to redo the entire army phase again. In an ideal situation, I hit all three shots without issue, but life isn't fair. Once I land the first three shots, phase two begins. Kogira screams out in pain, and Link is teleported to the top of the arena. I'm on a straight path to Splatsville, so I gotta land the next three shots before hitting the ground. As soon as I gain control, I dive below the boss and enter bullet time. These next three shots are the most important, so I use my last three rockets to land them. Rocket arrows basically fire in a straight line, so they help a ton with this boss. If you're curious how small the margin of error is here, I hit the ground less than a second after landing the final shot in this clip. I can't overstate how much trouble this first boss gave me. What's even more frustrating than the fight itself is the fact that you have to spend five minutes refighting army between every attempt. I easily spent three hours trying to beat Kogera a single time, but I can happily say the rest of the bosses are not nearly this bad. Up next is Marbled Goma, and this one was a breath of fresh air. I start the fight by healing any damage taken thus far and getting the attack up to effect. Goma fires boulders at you, but they can easily be recalled. The boulder explodes, and you can ascend right up to her eyeball. And that's phase one! Phase two has Goma stomping around a bit, but she'll eventually tucker herself out and fire more boulders your way. I have no idea why, but the speedrun puts this boulder beneath Goma's leg. Then I move over here, and something horrifying happens behind me. I don't know what, I'm too scared to look, but there's a lot of explosions. After this, I ascend up and finish boss number two. Mukturok isn't even a boss, I think he just lives down here. You need water damage to make Mukturok vulnerable, so that's why I killed those two jellies upstairs. After hitting it with water, you beat the shit out of it. Phase two is the same, but with more goop. Can we move on? Queen Gibdo is terrifying and this is when it really starts to matter that these bosses kill you in one hit. I follow the speedrunner strategy to the letter for this one. The moment I gain control, I fire electric key eyeballs at the boss. These are guaranteed hits due to the eyeballs tracking. After three volleys of pain, I go spinny-winny until phase two. Now she's gone and summoned backup, and any of these clowns can end the run in a second. I carefully fire another set of electric eyes, making sure to aim high so they target the boss and not the enemies that are fucking everywhere! After three of those, it's time to finish this. I use my last bomb shield to get some leverage and fire three bullet time shots into the queen's skull. Gibdo bones do massive damage, so three shots are all I need. Time for Seized Construct. This boss is my mortal enemy. Kogira might have taken me longer, but this robot bitch is 15 minutes deep into the boss rush. Failing now is a huge hit to my morale. As soon as the fight begins, I equip my sword spear. It gives me the added range of a spear, but I keep the ability to spin attack. The strategy here is to basically spin attack the Seize Construct and hope it doesn't hit you. We're in big girl country now, and every hit from the remaining bosses will spell my death. I like to circle the Construct with my shield out until there's an opening. If it strikes first, I get knocked over, but the boss doesn't follow up fast enough to kill me. Eventually, I commit to an opening of my own, charging a spin attack and letting her rip. Since the spear is so long, it usually hits the Construct twice. If it tries to shoot anything at me, I fire a bomb arrow to restart the cycle. This fight is always terrifying, and I have very little control of what's happening at any given time. But eventually, I smack the construct enough times to enter phase two. Phase two is even scarier somehow. The construct grows more arms and tries to fire cannons at me the whole time. Bomb arrows usually stop it, but sometimes they don't. I have no clue which way is up right now. I just white knuckle my controller and smack the boss until the game admits I won. 
The last boss of the gauntlet is Phantom Ganon, which is the easiest, in theory. You just need to flurry rush each phantom as they approach in a single file line. The problem with this fight is how nervous I am whenever I reach it. Things can spiral out of control pretty quickly here, and if you die now, well, don't do that. After 22 minutes of consecutive flawless gameplay, I bombed Phantom Ganon into oblivion and cleared the last major hurdle of the challenge. We're at the end, folks. Clearing the boss rush gives you a checkpoint, but it doesn't save the game. That means I need to do this here and now, otherwise I'll be sent back to the start when I boot up my Switch. I salvaged a few things from the battlefield and made my way to the big guy himself. I know I should spend a minute or two building suspense, but let's be real, nothing's gonna stop me now. Ganondorf's tough, yeah, but I've got momentum on my side. As soon as the fight begins, I take an intentional hit from Ganon. This puts me on a single heart and lets my broadsword deal 152 damage. Wowza, that's a good sword! Phase 2 is a bit trickier, but nothing I can't handle. If he does this ground slam attack, I'm pretty sure I just die. You're supposed to use your paraglider to fly above the shockwave, but as I've made painfully clear at this point, I don't fucking have one! It's fine though. He only does this attack with his mace, and he has three weapons to cycle through. After a few carefully timed flurry rushes with my super sword, Ganondorf is toast. In his pathetic gamer rage, Ganon vores some jewelry and turns into his fursona. Oh, hey, Sunlight. Did I just fail the challenge? We don't have time for that philosophical discussion. Baby Girl brought us the Master Sword, and we gotta put it to good use. This is my favorite final battle in the series. I know some people call it an auto-scroller, but it's not supposed to be difficult. That's what the last few fights were for. This is meant to be an epic spectacle with just the right amount of player input to keep you engaged, and I think they absolutely nailed it. Who doesn't want to jump between fighting dragons in the middle of a giant sky battle? You're a literal alien if this isn't cool to you. In one last bit of grace from the game developers, you can't die of fall damage on a dragon, so we don't even need the paraglider for this fight. I just moseyed my way up the dragon and slashed his gaping eye warts until the sky turned red. Gosh. This isn't like a review of Tears of the Kingdom. It's a challenge video, I know, but look at this. Listen to this. I'm in love. With one last skydive, I land on Ganon's big stupid face and drive the Master Sword into his secret stone. That's the final boss of the game! I got every piece of legendary clothing, every legendary weapon, all 120 light roots, and I even beat the game, all without breaking the rules of the challenge. After all this time, I can finally say it's over. I did it. <laughs> Whoa. Wait, oh my god, wait, add one more rule to the board! I have to save Zelda, that's the entire point of the fucking game, <laughs> shit! After completing the final goal of the challenge that was absolutely on the board at the start, I took my first steps on the surface as the Grand Champion of the Depths. I spent a few hours in the sky for setup and 30 hours in the underworld, but now I'm back on solid ground with fresh air. 
A lot of people criticize this game for not adding enough to stand out against the original. I guess I understand that on a conceptual level, but I couldn't disagree more. Even with restricting myself to the depths, I had an entire adventure down there with enemies to fight, quests to complete, a boatload of loot and goodies, and every boss in the game. I didn't just survive in the depths, I had the time of my life. If you've been looking for an excuse to finally play this game, consider this your guilty conscience speaking. Do yourself a favor and experience one of the best video games of all time. You can thank me later. For the rest of you, thank you so much for watching. This video took almost 200 hours to complete, but I don't regret it for a second. If you'd like to see more challenges, maybe stroke those metrics for me down below. And be sure to leave a comment if you have any good ideas for a challenge. I'd like to thank community member A Pile of Small Unripe Pumpkins for suggesting this challenge in my Discord server after I got trapped in the depths on stream. If they hadn't suggested this, none of us would be here right now. So be the next pile of pumpkins and leave your suggestions below. With all that said, have a great rest of your day. I'll see you soon with more gaming goodies.